Minister. Yes. Uh, the BBC. Tonight at 10. Tonight at 10. Tonight at 10. We're entering a nervous city. Only now, after a week of fighting and three ceasefires, do we think it's safe to enter Tripoli. Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. I went to meet Ann Nixon Cooper at her home in Atlanta. Good evening, we're live in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, in an underground shelter. He must be intubated fast. And we watch as medics put him to sleep. You join me on the front line, uh, one of many across northern Iraq. Berta Khan has already paid a heavy price for the cruelty of Mother Nature. We spoke with some Russian soldiers today in the town of Gori and asked when they thought they'd be heading home. Does it feel like a conveyor belt? It, it does, it does in a way, yeah. And I hate to say that because I hate to, to think of it like that, but yeah, yeah, it, it is almost, yeah. That's what the pandemic's yeah. done, I mean, yeah. it's no one's fault. No. talking to one of the uh, one of the rescue guys here who was saying that they're never without hope there could always be an air pocket down there that someone is still alive in the man who agreed to speak is a top lieutenant in the Sinaloa cartel how much people were killed there nobody knows and after November 3rd we're not gonna rest it's hard to steer a middle course in modern America. How many floors are taken up by COVID patients here? Uh, we've got patients on the third floor, fourth floor. This ward goes all the way around to the other side. It's 29 patients. Sixth floor, seventh floor, eighth floor. There's another COVID patient in here. Ninth floor. Another one in here. Tenth, eleventh. Is there going to be a 15th reincarnation after you? The very institution of Dalai Lama should continue or not up to Tibetan people. You're not stupid. You know what these drugs do to people across the border. Do you care about that? Now, a growing number of Ukrainians living in Britain are buying equipment and preparing to head for the front line here. It's uh, a painful time for the people of South Africa and particularly for the people here in Kunu. Nelson Mandela is a son of the soil here. That forms the natural barrier between Syria on that side and Lebanon over here. But that's the American story that despite its untold riches, millions always struggle. The explosions, the fire, the inferno, it must have been horrible for people hiding in their basements on either side of the street. Donald Trump's wall speaks to us all. We project on the barrier our own values. The Dab refugee camp is the biggest in the world. It's well over 350,000 people strong. They were picked up in boats that were listing, that were beginning to sink. Any kind of victory here seems a long way off. Few in Yemen have the luxury of memories that don't include a time of war. The inauguration today is, of course, testament to how far African-Americans have come from the plantation to the presidency. Every now and again, we hear the sound of artillery incoming from that direction. The front line's only about eight kilometers from here as the Russians continue to pull back. In Navajo Nation, they had to build a new cemetery to take all the dead. And this is one of your close friends. The Russians have been on the ground now for two weeks, winning the war and dictating the terms of the ceasefire. They've controlled events here from start to finish. Clive Myrie, BBC News in Northern Ethiopia. Clive Myrie, BBC News in Southern Yemen. Clive Myrie, BBC News, Washington. My Lord, I actually had hair in some of those shots. Um, oh, John, brilliant. Well done and well done to the guys for, for getting all that stuff together. That must have been a nightmare. Anyway, hello everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And uh, my thanks, of course, go to the trustees of the Steve Hewlett Scholarship Fund for the invitation to speak to you all. And isn't it wonderful that for another year, the fund will help two more Hewlett scholars, joining the seven talented students from lower income families already receiving support 
to work in this wonderful trade called journalism. Now, I had the privilege of interviewing Steve several times in his role as a media watcher, a man who knew the industry inside out and whose opinion on the latest pressing media issue I regularly sought, often for selfish reasons, because I wanted to know what the hell was going on, um, as well as to enlighten viewers. He was always entertaining in his analysis and razor sharp. Steve enlivened many a discussion. Indeed, I could well imagine Steve opening an edition of The Media Show on Radio 4, the program he helmed for several years, with the kind of mischievous question I'm about to ask you now. A question I very nearly posed to the Dean of Westminster, but more about that a little bit later. So, everyone, indulge me for a brief few seconds and close your eyes. All close your eyes. No peeking. Sir, in the pink shirt at the front, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now, imagine a world without the BBC. No EastEnders, no RuPaul's Drag Race, no Newsnight or Question Time or 10 o'clock news, no Glow Up or Strictly, no Proms, no Radio 4 or Radio 3 or iPlayer, no World Service, no Line of Duty or Peaky Blinders, no Attenborough and Planet Earth, and heaven forbid, no Mastermind. You can open your eyes now. Now, what kind of a world was it for you in the darkness? For some, I hope, a pretty poor one. Many others outside this hall would agree with you. Others, however, well, they'd shout, hip, hip, hooray. Their reasoning, why shouldn't the BBC, like other broadcasters, have to fight for its place in the market. It's an organization that's insulated and privileged, and guaranteed funding makes it soft and bloated and weak. If it couldn't survive in the open market, it should bloody well go. Hooray, they'd say. No more woke news, wokest programming. No more wokey left-wing indoctrination and pernicious identity politics. No more wokey blokies telling me I can't sing Rule Britannia at the last night of the proms. No more bonkers wokeites banging on about the lionesses not having any black players when they've just won the friggin' Euros. And others might say, hooray, but for curiously, exactly the opposite reasons. No more right-wing propaganda, they chant. No more pandering to reactionary forces, caving in to government pressure at every turn. It's a BBC that's cowed, they say, by the powerful. An institution that's lost its nerve and refuses to call out the bleeding obvious. It's a broadcaster not fit for a post-truth world of populists and liars, because, believe those critics, only their version of the truth matters. Only their version of the truth should be heard. Only their voice should be carried on the wind. They have right on their side, and everybody can see it. Due impartiality is a false God, they say. Hooray, others would argue, no more BBC, because finally it's the end of being regressively taxed just for the privilege of owning a telly. And no more jail for the poor and unemployed who can't afford a TV license. A quick fact check before we go on. You cannot be sent to prison for failing to pay a TV license fee only for failing to pay a fine in connection with a conviction for not paying the levy. And the latest figures for England and Wales show that no one, yes, no one, was jailed in 2020 
or 2021. In all this, there's a bigger picture that I see when I close my eyes and imagine a world without the BBC. And what I'm hoping to do in this lecture is show that the corporation, in fulfilling its core purposes, sits at the very heart of our society, actually helping to keep this country together. The BBC is a binding agent that unites us all, a kind of social glue. The corporation is actually, I believe, fundamental to who we are and our own idea of ourselves. As Patrick Barwise and Peter York, who I think I know are in the audience up there somewhere, as they write in their book, The War Against the BBC, who speaks for most of us? Or at least tries to? It's a great question, and one I'm sure many Americans, for example, are asking themselves that every single day. I would argue in the UK, it's the BBC. But how should the corporation marshal its defenses and make its case against hostile forces who'd like to see it crushed? As I've suggested, the attacks come from the political left as well as the right. And there are frontal assaults from commercial rivals for whom the BBC is a break on their potential profits. Well, for years, Auntie's response to his critics was to lean exclusively on the quality of the programming. Amazing value, cheap as chips, for a few pence a day. The belief was that the high standards, breadth and depth of the stuff the corporation produces should just speak for itself. And what can I get you, sir? Oh, give me a gin and tonic. No, make that a double. I need it. I just bought my television license. Ah. God, 58 quid. I ask you, 58 quid for the privilege of sitting in your own home, watching your own television set. It's diabolical. I mean, what's the BBC ever given us for 58 quid? God. They make excellent dramas, huh? What? They make excellent dramas, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. What? What? And pretty good natural history films. Yeah, yeah, but apart from excellent drama and the wonderful natural history programmes, what have the BBC ever given us? Well, there's some jolly good cricket coverage. And golf. Athletics. And Wimbledon. And racing. Oh, <laughs> sport. <laughs> And snooker. How could you miss it? And there's superb news coverage. From very early in the morning. News. <laughs> and there's politics. Elections. Current affairs. Yeah, true point taken. Documentaries. Yeah, all right. Documentaries granted. Consumer programmes. And series. Fine. All right. But uh, look, 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 the point is... Films. Yeah, yeah. But... And radio, too. And one. And three. And four. Yeah, all right. I forgot about radio. But... It's too. And science. All right, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. And comedy. Yeah, it's comedy. Yeah, that's always a laugh, isn't it? Yeah. And there's alternative comedy. Yeah, 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 all right. Fair enough. Yeah. All right, there's comedy and alternative comedy. But. And they did live aid for us. Oh, they did that, didn't they? Uh, okay, point taken. Fair enough. But, be fair. Apart from excellent drama, the natural history programmes, the sports coverage, news, current affairs, Documentaries, the consumer programmes, series, films, Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3, Radio 4, children's television, science, comedy, alternative comedy and music. What have the BBC ever given us? Well, there's, there's chat shows. Oh, shut up, Wogan. I mean, there's not even any commercials. Well, except this one. Now... Back then, in 1986, it was easy to focus on the content. There were few other big broadcast media competitors. 
Now, in 2022, for 44 pence a day for a color telly, so it's gone up, you get on top of John Cleese's list. BBC Three, BBC Four on television, Five Live and Six Music on radio. Online, there's the BBC News website, and the license fee now helps to pay for the world service. There is also, of course, iPlayer, all for less than 50 pence a day. Make no mistake, the quality of the product is as highly regarded now as it was almost 40 years ago. The corporation had five of the 10 most watched shows of 2021, with the finale of the crime drama, Line of Duty, coming out on top with 16 million viewers, the biggest drama of the 21st century so far. Of the 30 categories in this year's BAFTA TV Awards, the BBC won 10, despite all the other competition out there. When it comes to the news division, the most important characteristic has to be trust. And according to the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford University, in its digital news report for 2022. Despite levels of trust falling across broadcast media and print, the BBC is still, still the most trusted news brand in the UK. Independent research by Servation on behalf of BBC Education showed that the corporation at 67% was the most trusted news source for young people among traditional broadcast and print media as well as digital media, including Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Who knew? Young people may be glued to their smartphones and tablets for hours every day, but that doesn't necessarily mean they trust what they see, often unless it's news provided by the BBC. Of course, all isn't rosy. Acknowledging the BBC successes doesn't mean ignoring the public's concerns on bias, over impartiality, or possible groupthink. The BBC can shoot itself in the foot. There have been controversies, some big, some very big. The corporation is not and should not be above scrutiny. Indeed, it must be held to the highest standards, even when others are not. But we do seem to be living in an age of individual truths and opinion, where what constitutes veracity on any given topic is in the eye of the beholder. To strive for an objective truth is nowadays seen as old-fashioned, quaint, a bit naff, and boring. The equivalent of wearing kipper ties, beige bell-bottom trousers, and crimpling shirts. It's a bit 70s and 80s, partiality. It's messy, too. Impartiality, or more correctly, due impartiality, seems to have become an analog concept in the digital world. It sounds technical, bureaucratic. It sounds very BBC. So... I'm going to use a different word, fairness. Due impartiality is simply what's fair. Indeed, rules on impartiality for the broadcast media in America were known as the fairness doctrine, where controversial issues of public importance had to be reported in a manner reflecting differing viewpoints. But after more than 40 years, in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan allowed the doctrine to wither and die, which led to the rise of talk radio, shop jocks, Fox News, and MSNBC, and the complete disaster that is the American media landscape of today. Here, the public wants the BBC to stand for something. And surely that must be fairness. Opinions on one side of an argument and putting one side of the case, 
that's just not honest. Some might argue it isn't decent or morally acceptable in news and current affairs. In fact, it is a moral virtue to want to hear the other side of an argument in a democratic and pluralist society. If not, the results can be deeply damaging, as the cautionary tale of America suggests. The quest for a reality that we can all trust, regardless of who we are, is vital to the proper understanding of our world. And for a public service broadcaster, crucially one funded by a universal levy, the license fee, it is stark, staringly obvious that facts and objective truths must be paramount to maintain the universality of the BBC. It's an organization that does not belong to governments or a board of managers. It belongs to many millions of license fee payers who have all kinds of opinions and beliefs. Facts are the holy grail. Speaking objective truth to power is vital. Bend the truth to curry favor. Self-censor to get an easy ride. And you abuse the trust of license fee payers. Attempts to establish objective truths are needed now more than ever. Anyone, anyone can have an opinion. They're frankly to a penny. And opinions are colored by a whole range of variables. Your background, education, race, gender, politics, and so on. That's the point about opinion. It's individual to who you are. But as the novelist and newspaper editor C.P. Scott famously wrote, Comment is free. Facts are sacred. The liars and propagandists and demagogues can be called out, but within a factual framework that allows the public to see the charlatans for who they are. Because journalists, some risking their lives some losing their lives, managed to give the public all the facts. There is a humility in wanting to truly understand an important issue and not grandstand. And that is what hundreds of BBC journalists, my colleagues, much maligned from many quarters, that is what they quietly try to do every single day, without fear or favor. Now let's return to John Cleese, desperate for a double gin and tonic. Technology has created countless new opportunities for the public to be informed, educated, and entertained since he walked into that pub back in the 1980s. Nowadays, it's not enough to defend the license fee and, by extension, the BBC simply on the grounds of content. There are a whole host of providers out there winning Emmys and BAFTAs. Competitors are innovating and pushing boundaries. But so is the BBC. So given all that, why should the license fee perhaps stay? Well, it's time now to politely dump John, please, and try an altogether different tack to defend the BBC. <laughs> Melodramatic, slickly produced, gushing, sentimental tosh. <laughs> no. I don't believe so. That ad goes to the heart of what the BBC is actually about and why it matters to us all. And underpinning the idea that the BBC is something that belongs to every one of us is the concept of universality. There is something for everyone in its output. The BBC isn't just about Strictly. It's also about Radio 3 
and much more. The Royal Charter, which gives the BBC the right to exist, goes further, setting out five so-called public purposes for the corporation. They include providing impartial news, which we've talked about, supporting learning for people of all ages, showing the most creative, highest quality and distinctive output, but also reflecting the UK, its culture and values around the world. And the BBC must represent and serve diverse communities across the UK. And I quote, to bring people together for shared experiences, helping contribute to the social cohesion and well-being of the United Kingdom. Do you see Netflix doing that? Or doing this? This is a really, really difficult time for the nation. It's actually difficult for the organisation too, because, you know, um, people are, are worried like everybody else is. Uh, we're worried about how long we can keep all our services going. But what uh, the team have done is to come up with some ideas which I think plays to what the BBC is there to do, you know. Um, people, Such as? Well, Such people have been making comparisons with war, but, I mean, t take a couple of ideas. Um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled at the idea that uh, local radio could be the place which local radio does, and when local radio does it, it does it really, really well, the place where uh, uh, communities can come together to talk about what help they can give to each other. Can they get schemes going to help um, uh, people who are in, uh, you know, a, a kind of in lockdown themselves, old people or whatever. Can we, can we do something there which actually affects the community? Right the way around to uh, health, um, what, what health advice can you do? Exercises, recipes, because, you know, we're all having to live off whatever we've been able to get back from whatever's left on the supermarket shelves. All sorts of basic, uh, basic things like that, which I hope the one show will concentrate on. And then fundamentally, what uh, you and the, the news teams are doing, you know, day in, day out, which is the place you come to for the information we all need about how to not only just cope with, but where do you go to to find out what actually is going on in this extraordinary crisis? It was the worst of times, but I'd argue that for many, the BBC dulled a little bit of the pain because of its commitment to universality. This is what the then Director General Tony Hall said back in March 2020. In unprecedented times, the BBC has a special role to play as the nation comes to grip with the COVID crisis. We need to pull together to get through this. There were times during the worst days of the pandemic when almost eight and a half million viewers were tuning into the BBC News at six. Eight and a half million. The BBC News at 10 was getting over six and a half million viewers. And the one o'clock news, one o'clock news, almost five million viewers. It was made clear to us in the newsroom right at the start of the nightmare and in no uncertain terms that whatever happened, the main news would and must always go to air as scheduled. But it wasn't just the news that the BBC felt was invaluable for license fee payers during the time of COVID. The corporation launched virtual church services on Sunday mornings across local radio in England, as well as a weekly Sunday service on BBC One. And there was help and support for other religions and denominations. Every BBC local radio station partnered with volunteer groups to help coordinate support for the elderly, housebound or those at risk, making sure people knew what help was available in their area. And perhaps most spectacularly, the BBC came up with a 14-week initiative to provide educational programmes and lessons to every household in the country, whatever the child's age, who couldn't go to school. The corporation worked closely with teachers, the Department of Education in England, the Welsh Government, the Scottish Government, the Northern Ireland Executive, providing non-nation-specific curriculum-led activities and programming to complement the remote learning being offered by schools. This was public service broadcasting and a broadcaster fulfilling its mission for the betterment of society. No one can argue with that. But you have to wonder, 
Does the BBC itself actually talk enough about universality? Derived from the license fee and paid for by every one of us. Does it bang the drum enough? I suspect not. While the pandemic highlighted the true worth of the BBC, I believe, to a society that was fractured by lockdowns and splintered into individual households that were cut off from neighbours and other loved ones, that period also saw the rise of streaming services. They came into their own, paid for by subscriptions. Netflix, in the first half of 2020, added more than 26 million global subscribers during the time when Ofcom found that adults in the UK were spending as much as 40% of their waking hours in front of a screen. The streamers were making money hand over fist, and the critics of the license fee believed they'd found the magic bullet to the corporation's funding requirements. Make the BBC a subscription service just like Netflix. There's no question it is a challenging financial environment for the corporation at this moment in history. Successive funding settlements have been below the rate of inflation. Income for the BBC's UK services is 30% less in real terms than it was a decade ago. And the latest license fee deal, settled earlier this year, means the levy will stay well below the rate of inflation until 2024. That means the BBC is having to absorb rising costs with inflation projected by the Bank of England to hit 13% by the end of the year, and others suggesting it could be 18% or more in January. Tough choices are going to have to be made about which services the corporation will have to cut. So on the face of it, the subscription model might seem very attractive to the BBC's critics, like the Taxpayers' Alliance, and possibly even attractive to some within the BBC, if streamers are making jacuzzi loads of cash. If you're a senior exec in the corporation making big commercial hits, you might not have a problem with the subscription model. If there's a ton of money to be made, you might think it'll be easier to make strictly or whatever as well as those programs and services that are less commercial. But what if you end up chasing the money and the ratings most of the time? Neglecting the universality of the BBC. There are other problems inherent in the subscription model. I was talking recently to a star of British business teaching, Oded Königsberg a professor of marketing and currently the deputy dean of the London Business School. Now, we met at a conference that was analyzing the new subscription economy, and his areas of expertise are pricing and supply chain management. He's also analyzed and written extensively on Netflix. We chewed the fat over the growth of convenience-driven consumers, hungry for immediacy, and flexibility in obtaining any kind of product. One estimate sees the UK subscription economy growing from a market value of £395 million to £1.8 billion by 2025. 81% of households signed up for at least one subscription last year, according to research by Whistle, the logistics firm which helps deliver all those subscription packages to millions of homes. You can pretty much get a subscription for anything these days, from food to clothes to household cleaning products. It's not just magazines and newspapers any longer, and brands are eager to satisfy public appetites. So I asked Professor Koenigsberg if there was any sector where the subscription model doesn't really work where there are problems. That's easy, he said. The subscription model is terrible for the broadcast media. His argument is simple. 
Making good television can cost a lot of money. The fees for the best stars and presenters, directors, writers, only ever go one way, and that's up. The latest technology to make programs and films it inevitably costs more money too, year on year. Producing marquee, eye-popping television can be a bottomless money pit. That mitigates against an affordable subscription rate for most individuals of a few pounds a month. So while the cost of producing great content goes up, consumers end up paying less per unit of consumption year on year. It's a crazy plan. And to keep people interested, you have to make more expensive shows. Yet subscription fees stay the same. The professor says, as a financial model, it is an appallingly inefficient system. It is, in fact, in his words, the kiss of death. Unless you have a subscription and subscriber base big enough and deep enough to keep the prices low. But what has happened to Netflix since the coronavirus lockdowns came to an end? There's been a crash in the numbers of subscribers. Most recently, between April and July this year, when close to a million people walked away from the service. The second quarterly reduction in a row, resulting in the biggest loss of subscribers in the firm's history. So why is this happening? Well, rivals are challenging Netflix's dominance, and the market is now saturated. HBO Max, Hulu, Amazon, Prime, Apple TV, there are so many more. There are too many companies going after too few subscribers. Supply is exceeding demand. The days when one household might have two, three, even four subscriptions to different media groups is likely to be over, given the strain on household budgets of the current cost of living crisis. Disney Plus, not Netflix, is now the streaming king. With the most subscribers, just over 221 million worldwide, according to last month's Financial Times. Netflix, like other streamers, is also having to put up subscription prices because of rising inflation. Indeed, the wider grim economic picture also means streamers are having to trim their budgets at the same time. Disney Plus announced that this year it would reduce content spending by $1 billion. Warner Brothers and Discovery are talking about a combined cut of $3 billion. It's a vicious circle. While the streamers need more subscribers just to stand still financially, the days of crazy spending on numerous costly shows are no longer sustainable. But if you're a subscriber who signed up to a certain streamer because of their costly shows, you're going to feel shortchanged if the shows don't continue. So what do you do? You walk away, which is precisely what's happening to Netflix. Is this the uncertain future we would wish for the BBC? If the subscription model is adopted, but the revenues aren't coming in at high enough levels, what of universality? The principle that's helped cement the BBC at the heart of our nation for a hundred years. Inevitably, subscription would require the corporation to focus on programming that's big and sellable. And while the BBC does indeed sell shows and formats right around the world, at its core is a commitment to public service broadcasting and universality, which means an equal focus on output that the market isn't interested in providing, like a news division, for instance, that's impartial. Indeed, having a news division at all. Netflix and most other streamers don't do news, which means they don't do this. The birth of a new day brings a familiar demon. 
more COVID infections and more death. And it's others who must stare into the abyss to spare our eyes. I'm sorry. Like Hannah, a senior mortician at the Royal London Hospital, part of a small team of just five that's handled hundreds of bodies in this pandemic. How do you ever prepare for people just dying and dying and dying? You know, it's, although it's our job and we deal with dead people every day, um, this, this level, I, I think, is taking its toll. Does it feel like a conveyor belt? It, it does, it does in a way, yeah. And I hate to say that because I hate to, to think of it like that, but yeah, yeah, it, it is almost, yeah. That's what the pandemic's yeah. done, I mean, yeah. it's no one's fault. No. I've done this for years, you know, I'm just... When someone says to you, how does it make you feel when you, you're saying how it makes you feel? Well, yeah, this, this is how it makes me feel. Tonight at 10, we are live in Ukraine, a country at war after a huge Russian military offensive by land, sea and air. We were the first outsiders she'd seen since the Russians left on Friday. And the story of Alexei's death spilled out. The pain is so bad. Now I'm all alone. My son was young, 27 years old. He wanted to stay alive. After they killed her son, she fled and the Russian soldiers took over the house. And judging by the rubbish they left behind them, they were having a good time. Loads of bottles of vodka, Jack Daniels, Bell's whiskey, beer, you name it. It is hard to understand human behavior like this, but what makes it really tragic is that there are so many accounts of it happening where Russian soldiers have been and are now in Ukraine. The shells begin to land all around us, only meters away. You can see what they're up against here. This is daily, but the steadfastness of these men has been felt not just in Kharkiv, but around the world. They've had four weeks of this and still they remain. The Russians haven't been able to break the lines and this invasion might have come as a surprise to the rest of the world but this is what they've been expecting and training for for years Plus, max speed we're told to drive at maximum speed on the exposed road to lisichansk a dark horizon greets us residents praying for salvation as Russia lays waste. Tonight is a night, Clive. In Europe, or just behind you, thousands of Ukrainians are spending the night in the underground and in bomb shelters, and they're thinking the unthinkable. We all thought it was the unthinkable that Russian forces could be on their way to Kiev tomorrow. Netflix ain't doing that. The BBC, along with my colleagues at Sky, Channel 4 and ITN, all produced Ukraine coverage of a quality to rival any broadcaster on the planet. The BBC's own reporting was hailed by many as the epitome of public service broadcasting. Viewing figures for the week of the invasion of Ukraine, including the 1 o'clock news, and specially extended editions of the 6 o'clock news and 10 o'clock news, often topped 10 million viewers a day. The plaudits came in from across the British political spectrum and indeed from around the world. The Culture Secretary, Nadine Dorries, teared up in Parliament on citing the bravery of all the journalists from the UK's public service broadcasters. 
in bringing the Ukraine story to viewers, listeners, and readers. And yet, how quickly we forget. The debate about the future funding of the BBC is still up in the air, and plans are progressing to sell off Channel 4, despite a record surplus of £74 million announced in June. If privatised, this cash would go to shareholders instead of being seen on the telly, having been recycled into independent productions. Can we even guarantee there'll be a Channel 4 News after privatisation? Not necessarily. The Culture Secretary of our new Prime Minister has to make a renewed commitment to quality public service broadcasting at the BBC and Channel 4. It is too important to be left in the hands of the free market. I asked you all at the beginning of this lecture to close your eyes and imagine a world without the BBC. Well, the corporation tried a similar experiment back in April, launching what it called rather darkly a deprivation survey. The BBC commissioned a study from a team of researchers who took 80 households and deprived them of BBC content for nine days, including two weekends. No match of the day, no weekend news, no Strictly. Indeed, no TV and radio, recipes, podcasts, or access to any social media platforms linked to the corporation. Around 200 people were involved in the study. And there was an emphasis on those who, given the chance, would forego the BBC so they wouldn't have to pay the license fee, and those who said the license fee was too high. Before the research began, 30 households said they wanted to pay nothing and not receive the BBC services. Another 30 said they would want to pay less than the current license fee, and the remaining 20 said they'd pay the current fee or more. After the experiment, out of the 60 who were not keen on the current price, 42 said they would now pay the full license fee or more. That means 70% changed their minds. Only one household out of the 20 who initially supported the license fee said they'd rather pay less. After having been deprived of the BBC's output for a little over a week, many of those in the survey said it was the BBC they missed and wanted to turn to for trustworthy news. After their hiatus, the participants were handed an envelope with the value of that nine days content in relation to the overall license fee per year. It was less than four quid. Too many people undervalue the BBC and what it gives to this country and the rest of the world. As a foreign correspondent for many years based right around the globe, I know how much people from other countries value BBC programs. And now is the time. In an age of lies and deceit and propaganda with no shame, now is the time when the BBC is needed the most. In conclusion, I hope he won't mind me saying this, but the theme and title for this lecture came from a conversation I had with the Dean of Westminster at the end of last year, the very Reverend Dr. David Hoyle. I was filming a documentary on the crown jewels to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, and we were chatting by the tomb of Edward the Confessor in Westminster Abbey. Dr. Hoyle was ruminating on the monarchs who were uniters, able to heal divisions in the United Kingdom compared to those who tended to make things worse. And he said he felt the BBC had been vital in bringing people together during the COVID lockdowns. Along with the Queen, he said, in her address to the nation in April 2020. 
when she famously said, we will be with our friends again, we will be with our families again, we will meet again. Well, said the dean, using words to this effect, we destroy the BBC at our peril. I just nodded in slow, silent agreement. Thank you.